My uh, assigned talk is about multidisciplinary care for stage three and resectable stage four melanoma. So the current standard of care at the present time for stage three patients with lymph node metastasis and those with limited disease at distant sites, such as the skin, the lung, or other sites, is upfront surgery and then a selective use of adjuvant nodal basin irradiation, but in this case, only in patients who have multiple positive lymph nodes or recurrent regional lymph nodes. This does not increase survival, but it does decrease the rate, the risk of regional metastasis recurrence. And then because of the very effective systemic agents that Professor Demidoff has talked about, that we have based upon clinical trials, single agent anti-PD-1, or in patients with uh, um, BRAF V600 mutations, the combination of BRAF BEC. Or because there's so many new agents and combinations, clinical trials. The same is true for patients who have had a resected stage four disease at a distant site, again, it was reasonable to use either anti-PD-1, perhaps with a combination of low-dose anti-CTLA-4 uh, in combination or a clinical trial. And as Professor Demidoff said, again, in patients with the BRAF B600 mutation, the possibility of giving targeted therapy with a combination of BRAF MEK inhibitors. Now we need to go over why we're doing this operation. What are the goals of surgery when we're doing this for stage three or resectable stage four disease? First, we want to have durable local and regional disease control. And in some patients, this will help increase their long-term survival. And at the least, it is palliation. That is, we want to prevent symptoms of a patient in regional sites before the patient might die of distant disease at a later time. But we also want to minimize the morbidity and functional deficits uh, with the operations that we do. And finally, we want to reduce the risk for future regional or distant failure. And I want to show you in this next slide, two examples, one in the groin and one in the axilla. These are not patients from many years ago. These are recent patients who neglected to come into their doctors. They previously had regional disease that was not controlled, but before these patients died, you can see they had a terrible quality of life because of their regional disease that was growing through the skin and causing bleeding and infection. So even if we're not increasing survival, we want to maintain regional or distant disease control when we can do this. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on surgery alone because I want to talk about the future of treatment with neoadjuvant therapy, but just some basic principles of patients who have limited stage four disease that in this circumstance, surgical excision is a preferred treatment when the disease at distant sites is limited in one organ site, especially in patients who have had a disease-free interval for more than one year. We want to be sure that they do not have distant disease at some other site. And the key test here, after a history of physical exam, is a PET CT scan and a brain MRI. And I think our results now with surgical treatment of stage four disease is better because we're doing better staging, especially with PET CT scanning. Our goals here is not to increase survival rates because of surgery alone, but for relief of symptoms or preventing symptoms in a patient who's likely to have symptoms before they die. In those patients who have symptoms 
it is more acceptable to go ahead and do surgery. For example, a patient who has obstructed bowel or bleeding from bowel metastasis, these are patients where surgery might be justified. On the other hand, a patient who does not have any symptoms, such as lung metastasis, we need to be sure that surgery is safe and that we have a low risk benefit ratio. And as we've talked about before, with so many new agents systemically, we want to put our patients into clinical trials with either systemic adjuvant treatment after surgery, or as I will talk about next, as neoadjuvant systemic therapy with either immunotherapy or targeted therapy. Now, as Professor Demidoff said, there is already four major randomized clinical trials demonstrating a survival benefit with either targeted therapy with in patients with uh, uh, BRAF mutation using combinations of BRAF back or uh, with immunotherapy with anti-PD-1, either nivolumab in the checkmate studies or pembrolizumab in the keynote studies. Actually, the keynote study on the far right is probably the best study because it was the only one that compared the pembrolizumab with a placebo. And as you can see, there was a strikingly approved survival rate, both relapse-free and overall survival. However, these are very selected patients who got into these trials because they were screened and did not have any evidence of distant disease or multiple metastasis. And so there are also patients where upfront surgery um, and followed by adjuvant therapy still has patients who relapse, uh, who had more advanced disease than those who were in the clinical trials. So I want to spend the next few minutes in my talk talking about the future of multidisciplinary care for both advanced stage three disease, stage 3B, 3C, and 3D, and resectable stage four disease. And in this circumstance, my main message now, both now and in the future, is going to be in these patients giving new adjuvant systemic therapy. Now, I was going to start out by saying the future is treatment is neoadjuvant therapy, but I like this uh, publication by the European experts, including my friend uh, Alexander Egermont, uh, Christian Blake, and so forth. This was published just two months ago, making the case that the future is now for giving neoadjuvant immunotherapy not only in multiple tumor types, but specifically in melanoma. So I like this title because I believe this is true both now and in the immediate future. But the rules of engagement and monitoring responses to immunotherapy is different than our more classic responses with resist criteria in patients getting cytotoxic chemotherapy. And I want to show you two examples from my colleague, Dr. Merrick Ross at MD Anderson Cancer Center, who had a patient with bulky uh, groin metastasis and pelvic metastasis who had uh, anti-PD-1 therapy. After a few months, you could see that the masses were reduced in size, but were still present. But interesting, when Dr. Ross did a combined inguinal and iliac lymph node dissection, the masses that he saw were all chronic inflammation. There was no viable tumor. So let me give just one other example of one of Dr. Ross's patients here, an axillary metastasis. The tumor masses by CT scans were reduced in size, but at the time of surgery and pathology review, again, there was no viable tumor. So the key message here is radiological assessment is inaccurate in judging whether or not there is a true pathological complete response to these patients with getting immunotherapy. 
because the masses that we may be measuring on x-ray may be transformed from tumor into an inflammatory mass with scar tissue and we cannot tell the difference between a partial response or a complete response based upon x-ray. So surgery will be a key part of staging these patients uh, so that we know whether or not there's a pathological complete response. And if not, using the strategies that have been used effectively in breast cancer, we may need to change our therapy after surgery to some other treatment strategy. So from this article from my colleague, Dr. Jen Wargo, again in our melanoma service at MD Anderson, the advantages of neoadjuvant therapy in these patients I talked about is one, to downstage tumors and to increase the ease of surgical resection and in doing so, reducing the morbidity of the operation itself. The second is to use pathological response as a surrogate endpoint for long-term benefit. And as I'll show you in the studies that have been done, there's a very good correlation in patients having a pathological CR have an increased survival rate. And in fact, I'll tell you several times in the published results and in our experience at MD Anderson, patients who have a pathological complete response from anti-PD-1 therapy, we have not lost a single patient after who has had a pathological complete response, even after years of follow-up. So the other advantages is we can test novel combination strategies. As I'll show you, there are combinations of, of anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4 in different doses and dose schedules, and new investigational drugs that are coming on the scene with access to surgical samples for correlative analysis. So we could tell with a immediate exposure to systemic therapy, whether it works at all, or whether there are resistant clones of cells for which we may need to change our therapy approach after surgery. And then we have improved response rates from studies in patients with widespread uh, metastatic disease, since neoadjuvant patients are less likely to have been heavily pre been pretreated and less immunosuppressed. So it's clear that the responses of neoadjuvant therapy in patients who have not had any exposure to chemotherapy and who have more limited disease have an even higher responses than in patients with widespread metastatic disease, especially when given a second or third line therapy. Another rationale, and this again was published in Nature Medicine just a few months ago about <clears throat> the rationale for using neoadjuvant checkpoint black blockade. And this again is from our friends from the International Neoadjuvant Consortium, Georgina Long, Christian Blank, and others. So the rationale is if we do ad, uh, surgery and then give immunotherapy, there may be only a few clones of cells that don't boost the immune system very much. On the other hand, as shown in the lower panels, a patient who has intact tumor will have multiple, have a higher tumor burden and more clones of cells, so that at, with neoadjuvant immunotherapy, we're likely to get a better immune response, a stronger immune response, and therefore a longer survival when immunotherapy is given up front before surgery instead of after surgery. So there's a biological rationale for this as well. Now this also is prognostic. And I wanna again show you a, a study for the Mayo Clinic, uh, just showing the impact, the power of immunotherapy that we use today. A single dose of neoadjuvant PD-1 blockade, predicting clinical outcomes in patients with resectable melanoma. This is from the Mayo Clinic, published last year in Nature Medicine. And you can see with a single dose that actually 30% of patients had a pathological response and 10% uh, of those had a complete response after a single dose. And as you can see in those patients who had a PCR or a near PCR, that they had a long-term survival even out to 30 or 40 months. This is a small sample size, 
but compared to patients who had more viable tumor, that the survival rate was much less. So this is just an indication that the responses to immunotherapy can be prognostic in predicting survival. Now, another pilot study that again was done at MD Anderson in our multidisciplinary group led by our colleague Jennifer Wargo was in a patient, uh, patients who had a BRAF V600 mutations who got neoadjuvant, debrafidib and trimetinib versus standard of care before surgery. And in this uh, study, uh, patients who had uh, neoadjuvant therapy, it was a small study, had a pathological complete response of 62%. And in fact, the survival rate was so great compared to the standards of care that our data safety monitoring committee closed the study because the differences were too big. So this was a pilot study, but again, in this and many other studies I'll show you, there's a direct correlation with the complete response rate and survival. Here again, you can see survival rates. No patients have been lost in that study with follow-up after 25 months. Now this study was followed by a larger multi-institutional multi study led by Giorgino Long, again, a neoadjuvant study in patients with BRAF B600 mutation using a combination of debrafidib and trimetinib. And I just give a summary, but these responses, I've been doing melanoma clinical trials for 40 years. We've never seen these kinds of pathological complete responses ever in the past, except with these new agents. But look at this, a pathological complete response in 49% of patients. That's impressive. So now I wanna move on to using combinations of immunotherapy. Again, in these uh, studies, the Opacin Neo study of stage three, series of patients, papers that have been published in Lancet Oncology in the last two years. And this again is a phase two study to test different doses and dose schedules of the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab. Now remember in the past, we use high doses of ipilimumab, 10 milligrams per uh, kilogram, and the toxicity was very severe. But now ipilimumab is making a comeback in combination with the volumib at lower doses. And there is some evidence that this combination is better than either therapy as monotherapy alone. I won't go into the details of this study, this was a three-arm phase two study of different doses and dose schedules of ipilimumab and nivolumab in patients with stage three. This was all given up front. So here I have another key message. If one looks at the radiological response according to resist criteria, you can see that in these different dose schedules, and I'll tell you uh, schedule B is the best one, so I'll, I'll focus on that there was a 10% complete response rate and a 50% partial response rate. However, after surgery, if you look at, sorry, if you look at the pathological response after surgery, 57% of patients had a pathological complete response, seven a near PCR. So the key point here is, X-ray did not predict pathological complete response. You have to do the surgery and have the pathologist looking at it. So this is a key point. Surgery is the only reliable way to stage these patients. So again, if you look at these three uh, dose schedules, you can see patients who received a pathological response, very impressive, ranging from 80% to 65%. But this group B, had one of the highest response rates, and in fact, the highest complete response rate and was the least toxic. So these investigators now have gone on and used this schedule, which is uh, one milligram of, per kilogram of uh, ipilimumab and three milligrams per kilogram of nivolumab. And they've published in 
just recently, and I'll refer you to these two excellent articles in the February issue of Nature Medicine, where they pulled the data from 192 patients from six prospective neoadjuvant trials using either immunotherapy with anti PD1 with or without anti CTLA4 or targeted therapy with BRAF neck inhibitors. So I would refer you to this very important two articles looking at pathological response and uh, survival uh, with immunotherapy and targeted therapy. So here are the responses that they have published and again, with three years of follow-up in these high-risk patients. And as you can see, overall, in patients who got all kinds of new adjuvant therapy tar and targeted therapy, that the PCR, those who had a pathological complete response, 89% were alive at 24 months versus those that did not get a PCR of 48%. Very impressive differences. And then if one compared patients who got immunotherapy versus targeted therapy, and again, these are consistent results, patients in general who got immunotherapy did better and, uh, and had a more durable response than patients getting targeted neoadjuvant therapy. And this is very interesting as well. If one looks at the difference between immunotherapy and targeted therapy, as you can see on the left side, patients who had a PCR out to 33 months, no patients relapsed or died. And this is our experience at MD Anderson. These are incredibly impressive results. Whereas those who did not have a PCR still at two years had a 72% recurrence-free survival. But if one compares giving targeted neoadjuvant therapy, the results of those who got a PCR was good, but not as good as in immunotherapy, and those who did not get a PCR at even a lower survival rate. So this says, even in patients with BRAP mutations, our preference is to use immunotherapy as a first choice in these patients unless they have symptomatic disease or widespread metastasis and we want a more immediate response. So this is the conclusion from the study that was published just a few months ago. For neoadjuvant therapy, the two-year relapse-free survival was an impressive 96%. These were all high-risk patients, not stage 3A patients. Overall survival was 100%. Results were still impressive but lower in patients with targeted therapy. And the key point here is the pathological response should be an early surrogate endpoint for clinical trials and a new benchmark for development and approval of new agents in melanoma. So this is one other study I wanted to show you. It's a small study, but it's a very impressive study. These are 21 patients who had unresectable metastasis with stage three C disease using the seventh edition criteria. And after neoadjuvant uh, therapy with BRAF back inhibition, 86% of those patients were downstaged. And in 17 of the 18, an R0 resection was obtained. Remember, we started out with unresectable patients as judged by the surgeon. Also, to make the key point, none of these patients had a radiological complete response, but in fact, almost half of the patients had a PCR or a near PCR. Again, emphasizing radiological assessment is not accurate. So we have new clinical trials, both in Europe and international studies that I want to encourage all of you to uh, potentially participate in patients with advanced stage three. This is a one study, a randomized phase two study, comparing neoadjuvant versus adjuvant pembrolizumide. Uh, this is a trial in the United States with an accrual target of 556 patients that is being accrued right now. And then this is another trial that has started in Europe but is an international study a personalized response-driven adjuvant therapy after combination of IPI and NEVO. 
in patients with advanced stage three melanoma. And this is an interesting trial about surgical management. In this prospective trial, those patients who have a PCR or a near PCR uh, after an index node resection of metastasis do not have a completion node dissection, but have follow-up. And the same in this group of patients. But those who do not have a response go on and have an appropriate lymph node dissection. But the key point, although survival has not been published yet or presented, that so far in this trial, a therapeutic completion node dissection was omitted in 60% of the patients because of the effectiveness of their preoperative uh, ipilimumab and nivolumab, again, using that schedule B that I showed you earlier. So this is a paradigm shift. This is our future of melanoma management with these effective agents that Professor Demidoff talked about in metastatic disease that we're finding are even more powerful in improving survival rate and making a major change in what we do in surgery and what operations we do. But surgery is still important for staging of these patients. So neoadjuvant strategies for advanced resectable nodal disease is a rational approach. There is no delay in systemic therapy that we would ordinarily have it in patients who have upfront surgery and then adjuvant therapy. PCR, as I've showed you in multiple studies, is a surrogate for survival outcome. Combinations of strategies with these new dose schedules of low dose ipilimumab and an anti PD1 actually have increased PCR rates without uh, much increase in toxicity. And these kind of studies allow us to facilitate biomarkers, as Professor Demidoff had talked about early. And I agree with him that biomarkers are a key to our futures as well. This will also facilitate the studies of a more selective approach to lymph node dissection. It will be important for us to place clips or markers in the area of nodal metastasis so that we can remove the area where the nodal metastasis were in the first place and determine whether there was a pathological or a complete response or near. So this is my final slide. I don't believe that there is a need to wait for neoadjuvant versus adjuvant trial. As I showed you in the publication before, the future is now. But we don't have the results of these clinical trials that are being done. But so whenever the enter patients on clinical trials, especially I think these exciting neoadjuvant trials, so that we can ask a number of questions about what is the best regimen, how to minimize toxicity, the best imaging modalities. For example, PET-CT scans predict responses. The results so far are not conclusive. Biomarkers for predicting PCR, and then in the end, because of effective systemic therapy, can we do less surgery um, in our patients but still get the best results in terms of outcome. So I say Spasima uh, Bolshoi, and thank you for the honor of giving this presentation to my dear friends in Russia.